We're here to talk about SAP. So if you, uh, if you want to learn about social engineering, there's a better talk in the other room right now. Um, start off a little bit about myself. Um, I'm Chris. I do various stuff, podcasting and blogging and various things like that. Um, I'm a firm believer that the wisest man is he who knows that he knows nothing, which is a really bastardized quote from Socrates. Um, and I am certainly not an expert, okay? Despite the fact that I hate the word expert, um, I don't think anyone can be an expert on SAP, purely because the documentation sucks. So um, today we're going to talk about uh, SAP, obviously, what it is. We're going to talk a little bit about information and the information that you can get from an SAP system. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about getting in the middle, which will make more sense later on. We'll throw in some SSL stuff just for a laugh as well. We'll put it all together, and then we'll be stopping Bob. Does anyone here know Bob, or has ever actually met Bob? No. OK, great. So what's what? SAP. Who's heard of SAP? Damn. I was hoping I could just say that it farts rainbows and unicorns run it and stuff. But if you've actually heard of SAP, it's going to be a little bit problematic. Um, I also learned about SAP a while back, shortly before the hair loss incident. Um, I spent about 18 months reading books, looking at information, pulling all my hair out, trying desperately to find anything about SAP that I could. Um, again, back to the whole documentation sucks kind of thing. Um, unless you're a customer. If you're a customer, documentation is great. If you're not a customer, you get to this little wall where you have to log on, and then you just can't get past that. Um, SAP described themselves. Whoa, I'll move over here. SAP described themselves as the world's leading provider of business software. Blah blah blah. Marketing shit. Marketing shit. Everyone else describes them as the world's leading repository of business critical information. Security ain't our problem, and all the hackers like to get access to critical information. Okay. SAP, at its core, um, it does so much. You've got customer relationship management. You've got as I learned yesterday from FX's talk, industrial control systems. You don't want SAP touching your industrial control systems. Um, it does everything. It, it, runs, it runs banks. It runs car, car plants. You know, it runs manufacturing. It runs uh, ordering. It runs software. It runs everything. If you don't think SAP touches your lives, then you're probably not paying attention. OK? So is it that bad? SAP. Yeah and no. You know, SAP, like everything, has its issues. You know, it's, it's had, this is a, an article that came out last year on, I think it was on HISA, 500 patches in one go for SAP. You know, just imagine if Microsoft did that. You, you'd riot and then install Linux on all your servers. That's a lot of patches. And oh, by the way, they're, they're security patches. They're not just patches. That's the security patches. In total, in 2010, has anyone got a rough guide how many patches, how many security patches SAP released in 2010? No? Yeah, 900 to 1,000 security patches. And the question is, is that, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You can look at it from one point of view and say, 1,000 patches? Wow, what were you smoking you know, when you wrote this code? You know, there's a lot of bugs in code. There is between uh, 15 and 50 bugs per 1,000 lines of delivered code. And there's a lot of code in SAP. So, but you can look at it from the other point of view. A thousand, a thousand security patches, maybe they're actually starting to fix some of this shit. And I think they're moving more towards actually fixing this stuff. So hopefully, in about 15 years, SAP will actually be a reliable system. So what's the problem now? Thousands and thousands of controls, switches, and buttons. What button do I flick to turn on SSL? Know, and does this button turn on good SSL or SSL2 using a weak cipher? You know, there's so much configuration. There's so many issues there. It can't all be SAP's fault. There's a thousand and one SAP consultants out there who also have no idea what all these buttons do. They just go in and install it and go, default, yes, 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 default. Done. Secure. And the other problem is it's part of the business. You know, SAP installations 
fault of the business. It's like, it's this business data, this is a business system, these are business policies and business workflows. I am not interested in your techie doing anything on this. It's not an operations issue. Financial data is part of the business. So security never even touched the thing. You know, there's vulnerabilities in there, there's configuration issues. The best you're gonna get is maybe an audit of whether or not there's separation of privileges, whether or not you've got least practice, you know, uh, only access to the, the stuff that you should have. Are you separating dev, production, and testing? But when it really comes to security testing, yeah, it's, it's just full of fail. So, and the typical, you can't test that. It's business critical. Now, everyone has heard that. You know, you, you end up testing a test system which has been patched and fixed. But you can never actually touch the productive system which they've never changed because if they change it, they know things are going to break. They know processes are going like, to stop working. And yeah, maybe they're right. I mean, if their entire organization runs on SAP, if you take that system down as part of a test, if you're not experienced in SAP security, and you take this thing down for five minutes, it could cost the company 50 million. You know, and I, I wouldn't want to risk my reputation to take an SAP system down that's going to cost 50 million. And there's not many out there that would. So, SOAP, or SAP as it says, but who's, ever, who's heard of SOAP? Great, hackers should use more SOAP, that's all I have to say. I've been to DEF CON, yeah? You stink, man, you really stink. <laughs> um, hackers, yeah, okay, hackers and SOAP, we all know hackers smell, especially when they go to conferences. Um, simple object access protocol. It's being kind of phased out more. Um, nowadays, people tend to use REST instead of SOAP, but SAP still use SOAP, okay? So what are we talking about here? SAP NetWeaver, which is the latest definition from SAP. You've got SOAP, and there's a small amount of SAP NetWeaver. There's a number of different SOAP interfaces. And when you start looking at the security realm, what we're talking about is this small speck on the edge here. SAP is such a large target, and there's so many different SOAP interfaces, you couldn't fit this into a three-day long workshop. You know, SOAP interfaces are just mammoth. So let's talk a little bit about the SOAP management console. Um, it defaults to running on five instance number, 13 and 14. Instance number is simply, you can run multiple instances on an SAP box. So it starts at 00, 01, et cetera, et cetera. So you're gonna have various different numbers here depending on what instance you're running. Okay, so you've got multiple targets all running on the same machine. It can use SSL, and as we all know, SSL will save the day. SSL will stop everything. That's if it's configured, but uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But of course it uses basic auth. Yes, it's 2011. Yes, companies still use basic auth. Yes, basic auth is still plain text. You know, we know this. There's lots of different options out there they could be using, but it's scary and surprising how many times you see them using non-SSL um, and basic auth. Okay, so I'm not even sure why they use that function still. Oh, and did I mention SAP is enabled by default on all SAP systems? So. This isn't something that you have to go in and, and turn on, and then maybe if you turn it on and don't configure it correctly, you're vulnerable. This is on every single SAP system out there by default. Um, even on the test boxes that I've downloaded, you, you can download a number of trial and test boxes for Windows, for Linux. And the only thing that runs on those by default is SAP Management Console. Nothing else runs on them. You need to go in and configure it and install licenses. So this even runs when your license is expired, which is great because you find lots of test and dev boxes that are just sitting around. Um, there's a number of different ways you can interact with the management console. Um, you've got the, the typical SAP MMC console, um, where you can have access to your box and all of the, the various functionality. You can see how your, your SAP system is running at the moment. And then you've got Java. Oh, we should probably accept that. Oh, it expired in 2002. Oh, not a problem. I'm sure if we accept it, it'll be fine. Just ask Dave for a demo on how to man in the middle of that. Um, is you get the same basic thing through Java, and, and we love Java, especially as attackers, because every time it loads a Java applet, a kitten dies somewhere. Um, yeah. So information is king, uh, especially when it comes to SAP. Um, SAP likes to give you information. It's a very friendly system. 
yeah, it's ironic. Um, it, especially with, with SAP Management Console, if you connect to this thing, it's going to give you information whether you like it or not. You know, you, you're going to send a, sh a packet to it, and it's just going to give you pages and pages of XML back. Um, the question isn't whether or not you can get information out of S SAP, especially the Management Console. The question is whether or not you can filter through all of the information that they provide to you and use it for anything useful. Because there's so much there, it's hard to bring everything together. What do you look at first? The shiny things here, the shiny things there, and there's shiny things that you need to dig in a little bit and connect the dots, and then suddenly, you ha, you, you've got root. So, down to it. What can I get out of these, out of this information out of SAP Management Console? Version information. Woo. You can get that from HTTP headers, like it says on the screen. Um, but SAP, uh, in their wisdom, provide a large range of, uh, of information on, on what version you're using, um, all the way down to the individual patch level. So you can say whether or not they've installed this individual patch on the system. You can tell whether or not it's running an NT architecture, an Intel architecture, if it's an AIX box, if it's a Linux box. They like to give you that information because it's needed for the management console. Otherwise, they don't know whether or not to make the little icon a Windows box or the little icon a Unix box. So it's helpful for us here. Um, before we dive in, uh, does everyone know what the Metasploit framework is? Okay. No, never heard of it. No. Okay. I'm not going to go into Metasploit. It's a it's a framework for exploitation for anyone who hasn't heard of it. Um, so a quick example of how we're going to run these modules. These modules are all now in SVN as of five days ago or something. Um, you're simply specifying the, the module you want to run, SAP Management Console version, showing the options, and then setting. The only two that are interesting here are the R hosts. You can specify multiple hosts here, an entire subnet, subnet um, or a file, and you can access everything. And the remote port. In this case, we're using 50013, which is the 00 instance, because that's our, our default target. And what you get back from the Management Console is a huge amount of XML, which is nicely passed into a, a couple of lines of interesting information. You've got the version information, 720, patch 70, change list 12035. Like I said, it's very detailed. You know, this thing likes to give you information. Um, and a couple of bits of key information, NT Intel, you know it's running an Intel architecture, and you know it's running an NT system. By NT, it means Windows 2000 and Windows 2003, Windows XP, in this case XP, um, Windows 2008, Windows 7. You know, it, it uses NT for everything. And then you get this here, the SAP SID, um, which is a standard three letters, in this case NSP, which is one of the test versions, um, and is really useful for everything we do with SAP. So useful that they pretty much return it every single time you ask for any piece of information. So um, what else can you get? You can get the startup profile. You can get the instance name, the SAP system name, SAP SID again database schema paths. You can even check to see which version of database they're using. For example, here you can get the exact SAP profile paths. You can get the system name again, which is the SAP SID. You get the information about what the, the ID is and the instance name, which is again is really, really helpful information. And you get... No, this is all free, unauthenticated. You don't need to provide any authentication at all. Okay? Yeah, it's a, it's a zero day. Dave. <laughs> so where was I? <laughs> yeah, uh, server instance environment. This is this is also great stuff. If you've ever run export or set on your box, um, just to be able to output the entire environment variables of the user that's running this process, full environment list down to individual information about databases. You got here obviously the the various pieces of information about whether or not system 32 they're running a 32-bit system, what the system name is. The database type, in this case ADA, which says they're using a, a SAP DB. Um, here it would also say things like Aura for Oracle, or uh, MSS, I believe, for, M for Microsoft SQL. It's also going to give information about the username. So this here, key piece of information. This is the username that your requests are being run as. So we already have half of the information we need to brute force access to the system. We now know what the SID is, we know what database it is, we know whether or not it's using PowerShell, and we know the username, and that's really, really important. Okay. Um, SAP logs and trace files, a little bit of background on this. Um, if you have a developer accessing a system, they're usually coding in ABAP or Java, 
depending on, on which version they're using. If they have any kind of problems with their coding, they turn on debugging, and it saves it to a debug log file, developer traces. So every time they get an error, it outputs exactly what it was doing, maybe like a SQL request or a username password or a connection attempt to an external box. It outputs a number of interesting parameters that are great for developers. Um, also great for penetration testers, especially when you can list log files unauthenticated remotely. So you simply log on, run this, it's going to give you a, an entire list of log files, whether those are startup log files, dev ECM, or ICM, which is Internet Connection Manager, which is the HTTP, HTTPS uh, front end for SAP systems. You can get so much valuable information. I mean, this is a, a basic developer trace. Unfortunately, there's not many developers on my test system because I can't code an ABAP. Um, but it's simple stuff like this is allocating memory. That must be useful if you're trying to do a buffer overflow to know where things are loading in memory. I'm not a uh, buffer overflow expert, but I'm sure that could come in handy later. And you get other stuff as well, like the, the syslog responses. You get when things were started, what the PID number is, and exactly what version of ICM they're using, um, which is also really good, especially for targeted attacks, um, things where you really want to dig down and figure out exactly what they're running on the remote system. Things like Nessus aren't going to tell you this stuff. So um, what else is in those log files? I mean, there's gold in those log files. Every time there's an error on the system, someone puts in a log file. So someone types in their username wrong. What appears in the log file? This username logged in incorrectly. Great. So on an active production box, we're going we're gonna to log in. Oh, we're not going to log in, sorry. We're going to connect freely and without authentication. And we're just going to download the error log file and scrape it and see what usernames are there. So there you go. Here's 10 entries that have been found on a test box. Last time I ran this on Productive, I got 1,735. Uh, yeah. So here you have a list of valid SAP usernames, or theoretically valid. They could have mistyped their username. You can just go through this. I guarantee you if you have 1,735 usernames, someone has set their username to the same as their password. Always. Passwords suck. That's just the way things are. So now you've got, you've got the username that the entire uh, SAP management console is running on, which is an administrative user. You've got a list of valid SAP account names. You've got their entire environment. You can look at their log files, and if you're lucky, you can find SQL queries, you can find database structures, you can find huge amounts of gold in those things. Okay? So what else can we get? Process parameters. Now if, you've, if anyone's ever dealt with SAP, process parameters are basically the entire configuration of SAP. It's everything. It's, it's a list of how SAP works. Paths, usernames, configuration variables, names, everything you'd want. So we've got a list of SAP users. Well, what can we do with that? We can pull out the, the, the process parameters. And this, this is an example, because the actual list that it outputs is, again, thousands and thousands of lines of XML. So I've, I've filtered on login password, simple regex, and I've got this. It uses a specific char set, the hash algorithm, the encoding. It uses SHA-1. That's kind of depressing. SHA-1. It's going to be really hard for us to brute force. Luckily enough, it uses downward, compati downward compatible passwords, which means along with SHA-1, it'll also put it in a plain MD5 for you, which is really handy to know. Um, not only that, but this downward compatibility mode means that if you log in with any one of these SAP users that we found here, if their password is 25 characters long and upper lowercase, uh, backwards compatibility mode means you can also log in with the first eight characters as long as it's all uppercase. So LM hashes all over again. Thanks, thanks for coming. So we've already found quite a lot of information. This is like a gold mine, and this is, this is stuff that either Nessus won't find or Nessus will put as, yeah, it's kind of a low. It's only information. You know, this, is, this is really good information. Um, you also get things like log directories. You know, you invalid log on attempts to lock user. Okay, now I know I can try four 
before you reset the counter. Okay. And the counter on SAP resets at midnight. So just before midnight, you do five attempts and you lock the user. And if the setting is to automatically unlock, at midnight the user will unlock and you can try five attempts again. So if you know the configuration and you know whether or not auto lockout, fails user lock, min password uh, length, password char set, you've got all of this information. So basically, you can do a white box test while you're doing a black box test. That's great. So you can do all this auditing stuff even though you're doing a black box test from external. So I've got a quick demo, if this works. So trust me, that animation took a long time. <laughs> so I've got here a, a little SAP box running on Windows XP, which is only using about six gigabytes of memory. And I have here um, Metasploit, which I upgraded from yesterday, I believe. Yeah. 28th, so this is yesterday. Um, I'll do a quick search on SAP management and give you an overview of the, the modules that are in there at the moment quickly, because there's a thousand of them. Yay. Okay, there's thousands of these things right now. Okay, so if, if you want to look at these modules, you've got instance control properties, you've got console log files, you've got start profiles, version information. So I'll just do a quick box scanner SAP management version. So we've already specified the remote host, which is the host we're targeting, and the remote port. And it's easy as run. There you go. So we get the version information, the patch, the change list, everything. We get the, the SAP SID. And there's literally huge amounts of information to be had here. So this log files. Wow, look at all those log files. And I'm sure in one of these developers, there's going to be some really interesting stuff. Some stuff that you're really going to be aching, aching to read. Yeah, basically all you do is specify the log file. Um, there's two, two modules, one called uh, list log files. I will show you the... Um, not specifically, no. So, and the other one is get log files. So, so get options again. It defaults to the start, sap start dot log, which is the the configuration. Whenever it starts up, it writes a log. You simply run, and it downloads the file to your loot. So, if you check in loot, there's trace files information. You can then simply just view this XML, which we can do if my mouse works. There you go. Copy, and then we can run Firefox, which is unfortunately the best available uh, XML browser that I have at the moment. So um, in answer to your question, Dave, yeah, there's a possibility to tie things down, which I'll, I'll touch on a little bit later, um, but not tie it down in a way that I would consider actually safe. So um, here's a simple log. I mean, this is the small version of the log. They like to use XML. So everything comes in an XML format. It just simply tells you when things started, what the exact path of the profile is, which is a, that profile here is the profile parameters that we downloaded through XML. Um, yeah, there's, there's a, a host of information here, which is, which is more than interesting. So. So information overload. This is all unauthenticated. Okay, there's, there's no username and password required to access any of the information that we've currently accessed. But you have to be in the network, right? Yeah, we have to be in the network. Um, I thought we had to be in the network too, and and I was really really hoping that people using SAP didn't decide that they wanted to put it out there on the internet. So. Um, I ran a small scan of Austria, so it's just a small IP range, maybe you know, a couple of hundred thousand IPs, and came up with a variety of SAP boxes. You know? um, I also didn't get arrested yet. <laughs> so um, in total, I, I, I 
scanned on four individual ports, mainly because I wanted to, I wanted to get a feeling, because if I'm just scanning blindly for port 50013, it could be anything. It could be SSH running on that. Okay, so if I'm scanning for SAP router port 3299, SAP gateway 3300, SAP management console 50013 and 50014 for the SSL version, if they all come out at around the same number, like 2600, then you can be pretty sure that those are SAP boxes. Because sending a SYN packet is fine. Sending, uh, you get the SYN act back and, okay, that port's open. As soon as I connect to it, it starts to get a little bit messy. As soon as you start connecting to these systems and probing them and seeing if it really is SAP Management Console and if you can just check the version information, what point do you go from this is research and I'm just interested to I'm fucking around with your production SAP box and you're going to sue the shit out of me? I didn't really want to see. Um, but I did laugh. <laughs> I did laugh um, a lot when I saw that. I mean, it's soap. So HTTP, yeah. So it's it's like HTTP, a SOAP envelope, um, not encrypted. There's no HMAC. There's nothing. There's no authentication on it at all. So it's not even. If you connect on five zero zero one three, you get a response from the server to say, well, you're going to need this applet, and it provides it to you. So, and I'll touch on that in a minute. What's next? Getting in the middle. This is something I was working on, but didn't quite manage to get fully finished. Um, because it uses basic authentication, um, SAP Management Console uses this nice little window here in Java to say you need your user ID and password. It doesn't even look like basic authentication. Because it's a Java applet, in the background, it's sending basic auth. But I'm willing to bet quite a lot of SAP administrators think that this is secure because it's, it's like all SAP'd up. It's got the logo and everything. Look, the smallest SAP logo in the world. Um, but, I mean, basic auth, as we know, it's, it sends a request. <laughs> you get the response telling you to basically piss off unless you've got the right username and password. You provide the clear text password, and it lets you in. I mean, so what's to stop you from man in the middling that? Nothing. I mean. There's so many different ways to man in the middle of that. I mean, I, I couldn't even fit them on a slide, so I didn't even bother trying. You proxy it, you, you use HSRP, you do ARP spoofing, DNS poisoning. There's a thousand and one possible ways for you to sit in the middle of this connection. Okay? Depending on where you are in the world and where they are in the world, there's a lot of stuff. Okay? So what do you do? You sit in the middle. They make an unauthenticated request, which they always make, because they need the version information to sell you which kind of little icon. Do you need a Windows icon or a Linux icon? Well. You simply reply back and say, no, I need a username and password. And if, and if they're stupid enough, these are users, um, or they have it saved somewhere, or this is somewhere in their browser, they will send it to you in clear text. Okay, Credentials for the win. And what are these credentials that we get? Administrative credentials for us to do whatever we want on the remote system, more than we've, what we've been doing right now. So instead of doing this, we sit in the middle, we get the request. We send a response back saying, no, you're going to need to auth for that. They send us the auth token. We start doing the happy dance while we send it on to SAP and let them go on their merry little way. So we've got a username and password that we can use for whatever we want. But wait, DigiNotar will save us. SSL for the win. Surely if it's SSL, there's nothing we can do about that. Um, ignoring the fact that the Java applet expired in 2002. So, um, there's a couple of different ways that SSL gets implemented, especially in large infrastructure. You've got self-signed certs, which are great for us, not so great for them. You've got default certs, device defaults, which isn't really an option for SAP. It's mostly hardware devices. They come with a cert already embedded on them, um, which is usually a, a cert that's shared between multiple devices, which is also terrible. Um, check the little black box project for that. They pull them out of these devices and make them available for download. Um, there's Enterprise CA. You can sign your own cert centrally. And I see this a lot. I don't know what you guys see, but companies don't want to pay for SSL certs, valid SSL certs, inside their enterprise. So they set up their own PKI, PKI infrastructure. They sign their own certs, which means they're responsible for things. Or they go externally. Did you notice to the rescue? SAP also 
offer the ability to sign certs for SSL connections to SAP systems. I'm not sure how many people use that, but I'd trust them. Um, so how can we get in the middle? You impersonate the SSL. You know, sounds kind of complex. It's not. There's a module in Metasploit as of a couple of days ago which creates a fake cert, um, uses this wonderful SE option to say it expired yesterday. Yeah, my SE skills are pretty weak. <laughs> um, but you'd be surprised how many people just click on it and like, ah, oh, those operations fools forgot to replace the cert that expired yesterday. I'm just going to click yes and I'll phone them later. The second they click yes, you win. Okay? But the whole SSL impersonation is a talk for another day, but SSL is not going to save you in this case. Okay? SSL has been beaten on a lot. Okay? SSL is right now is really full of fail. So how can we put all this together? We've got all the pieces of SAP, um, but how can we put all this together? Because information is great, but we want OS execution. SAP Management Console offers an op an OS execution function. Um, when I asked them why, they couldn't tell me. But I'm sure when they originally wrote the spec, they thought it was going to be a great idea. So we have OS execution. We can run a command, but wait a minute. Username and password. OK, so we've talked about man in the middle. We've talked about basic auth being clear text. You can sniff it. You can man in the middle it. We've also got the username already. So we can brute force that username and password, can't we? I mean, it's simple. Um, check under the keyboard, post-it notes rubber hose. Beat someone until they give them the, the SAP username and password. Um, brute force is pretty simple. It's a couple of nice features where you can put the SAP SID in and it will automatically replace the, uh, the SID in the password. So you set the SAP SID and it will automatically try default usernames, default passwords, or what it conceives as default usernames and passwords. And then suddenly um, you find one that works. Prod admin or dev admin, whatever you want. It doesn't because these aren't SAP users. These are operating system users. So you have, um, for example, SAP Service NSP is the user that we found previously with one of the modules. Okay? In a Linux box, that would be NSP ADM. Okay? So they have standard usernames, but the passwords, there's no kind of SAP star, pass, and various kind of weak SAP username passwords combinations, as far as I'm aware. That's yeah, this is operating system authentication. Because this is OS authentication. This is operating system execution. It authenticates to the actual underlying operating system itself. So even if you've got SAP lockout, if you haven't got lockout enabled on your Linux box, you can sit there and brute force this password until you boot it in the face. Okay. No, the, the management interface, it also uses um, Windows or Linux or whatever the underlying operating system is authentication. So that's not using SAP username and passwords at all. There's a feature in the, uh, in the interface um, where you can run SAP commands within SAP itself. That requires a separate authentication. Okay. But this is actually operating system usernames and passwords. Okay, so the question is how well are they uh, hardening their underlying infrastructure? How well have you got lockouts on your... Uh, on your Linux box. Are they locking the administrator account? Okay? Because even if the, the user that you brute force, like administrator for example, it won't have the ability to run operating system commands because in SAP it doesn't have that right, it's not in the correct group. For SAP itself. That doesn't apply to these, these accounts. Yeah, so the, the, the question was the, the previous uh, username password and the previous usernames that we extracted from the logs are SAP usernames itself. We're looking now at the, the operating system user account, which is differently controlled and has different policies. Okay, so you brute force the username password or you get it through using a man in the middle attack, social engineering, however you want to go about that. And you simply put in the information in the OS execution module, tell it what command to run, and it runs it and gives you the output. Okay. Sorry if that's a little bit small for you guys to see at the back. That's great, but you know I don't want to run one command. I want full control of the system. Um, if I wanted to run one command, then yeah. But Meterpreter, if you can run one command, you can get Meterpreter. 
okay? Dave's the guy to talk to if he's not asleep at the back. But, um, you encode the payload, you split it up into little chunks, you shove it into Windows, it stores it in the file, you decode it, you start it, and you start winning, okay? So you just break it up into smaller chunks that you can provide over uh, SOAP requests and run each individual command in to build up your payload, okay? This is stuff that's built into the exploit itself, so stuff that's not that hard to do. So, um, quick demo of getting Meterpreter. So, find where my mouse is. Great. There you go. So, fail. Knew this would happen. Ah, that's where they moved it to. Sorry, this only just got accepted in, so they moved it around after I got it in there. So, set management console payload. Show options. All we're going to have to do here is just set the R host to our attack box. We set the username, which we've already brute forced, which is SAP service NSP. And we're going to set the password, which in this case is actually change me. Okay, so. So, and we simply do an exploit and pray that this actually works. Okay, so it's connecting. All it does here is break up the exploit into smaller chunks, which is configurable depending on the speed of your connection. It then breaks everything up uh, for the final connection of the payload, and you end up getting a interpreter session. Woo. You actually jumped ahead because I, I actually had a a nice slide that tells you to clap. <laughs> so yeah, here's my backup plan in the event that it fails hideously, which it almost did. So you don't have to do that. It's already done. So um, stopping Bob. Okay. Does everyone know who Bob is? I mean, theoretically, know who Bob is. Bob is the invisible bad guy, um, the person who breaks into your systems and does everything that you don't want to do or aren't able to do. So if someone did something bad. Bob did it. And, um, just for legal reasons, I'm not saying that Bob the Builder or indeed Bob the Baumeister is an evil, evil hacker, but I don't see him around often, so you never know what he's doing. Now. So um, fixing this, why is your SAP management console available from the internet? Why is this available to the world? Um, hmm? remote, yeah, remote support. Because people need to be able to remotely manage your productive enterprise infrastructure from the beach. OK? Yeah. This, this, is, this is the reason why we can't have nice things. Yeah? If you need to be able to provide 
five administrators with the ability to connect from home, sit in the garden, do their work, and remote connect, then somewhere on a firewall there needs to be their specific IPs. Okay? But from what I've seen, these things are just sitting out there ready to be connected to by everyone in the world. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, because I scanned from Switzerland, and I scanned the entirety of Austria. So maybe they're blocked from China. Maybe they're blocked from Russia. Um, I don't know. Maybe I should check. You know, I just get a, get a random proxy in China and see whether or not I can connect to. And trust me, if an idiot like me can find this shit, then someone smarter than me is already in these systems, exploiting these vulnerabilities, um, because this stuff's not hard. Yeah. So HTTP, it's bad. I mean, terrible, fucking terrible, bad. HTTPS, not quite as bad. SSL still sucks, but. Uh, but it's what we've got, and there's not a lot else we can do. But please don't use self-signed certs, because that's just stupid. Um, SAP also fixed this bug in SAP note 1439, blah, blah, blah. Um, unless you're a customer, you don't get access to this. And in my personal research, I don't personally at home have an SAP infrastructure that I pay maintenance for. So they don't want to give me access to this SAP note. So I haven't actually read what it does, officially. Unofficially, I may have got a copy of it. And I may have read it. Um, their solution is to enforce authentication for more than you do right now. And that's not everything. You can still get the version information. You can still get the status. You can still get a number of things. But you can enforce authentication earlier on in the process. So you can't start downloading logs, so which was, was Dave's question. Um, but obviously, if you're doing it over HTTP, you're still going to fail horribly, because it's clear text, and anyone can sniff it. And you just get the username and password earlier on in the process. Plus, it's not going to stop people from man in the middle of your connections. Okay? Plus. SAP never turn these things on by default. So this fix, when you install it, will do absolutely nothing until you go into one of the 1,001 configuration options and say 1 instead of 0. Then you restart your productive box and hope that it comes back up, because if it doesn't, you've lost 50 million every minute that it's down. So this bug will remain in SAP for a number of years to come, okay? because people are not willing to take the, their systems down and do this kind of stuff. SAP is hard. Okay. Um, next steps for me, I'm, I'm working on some man in the middle stuff. I mean, I talked a little about man in the middle in here. Um, I've got a module that forces authentication. Um, it's not that hard to do, really. You just sit in the middle and just reply back and say, no, you need to give me a username and password before you pass anything on. Um, it doesn't like post requests, unfortunately, which is something I need to work on. Um, Java applet deployment is something else I'm working on as well, because if you connect to the web interface, it tries to shovel a couple of Java applets down to you. And it would be really nice if one of them was just a Metasploit module. That way you get access to the, the guy sitting on the beach doing his remote administration. And then you get all the username and password access from there. Game over. Um, I'm also planning on looking at the SAP SSL implementation, because face it, um, everyone else's SS SSL implementation really sucks. So that's what I got. Questions? You can throw things now if you like. Please. Yeah. Uh, one question about blaming HTTP for it. I mean, um, I, 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 do, I do see that there's uh, some weakness, there's a lot of weaknesses in HTTP traffic, but mm -hmm. do, do you think that if they would be using any other protocol, they would be less spreading out information? I mean, um, they, they're doing this, um, they're spreading out that information because they need to show the icon for the uh, SAP management console and stuff like this. So um, that's not HTTP's fault by. Uh, no, no, but, but they could easily do this over another protocol which is secured by default. They could do okay. this over, uh, they could use client side certificates. They could do this in a number of secured ways. I mean, SSL is the core of quite a lot of solutions that we use. Um, <laughs> yeah, by 64 everything. Um, my simple uh, comment here is such a critical piece of your enterprise infrastructure should never, ever, ever talk over HTTP to anything. Okay. I don't care if it's legitimate. That's just stupid. Okay. You know, even Nessus will tell you that, I hope. And I have an another question. Like, um, is there, um, 
uh, is it a fr free di a trial for downloading that? Um, uh, I know I've, I've the, the modules? No, the SAP. Yeah, there's a number of free modules. I wrote a, a blog post on how much of a pain in the ass it is to get SAP running. Um, there's a number of links. You can download Windows versions, you can download Linux versions, and you can spend the next three and a half months trying to get a m demo version working. Um, it's not the nicest installer in the world. Okay, so would you uh, be interested in sharing a virtual image? <laughs> 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 of um, a pre-installed version. Certainly, um, if you have just for if research, if you have course. 60 gigabytes of available space, you can have the virtual machine from my system. Uh, uh, when it installs itself, it needs four gigabytes of RAM, uh, virtual memory of 16 gigabytes, I believe, 60 gigabytes of available space on your disk, um, an English version of Windows if it's a Windows version, um, but you can trick it with a German version. Basically, it's a pain in the ass. Okay. Um, and even then, mine is limited to SAP Management Console because that's what I'm researching in the moment. There's no license for anything else. So, um, but th there's some there's some good downloads and good links available on the blog, and you can get them straight from from SAP. There's a there's a page that if you can find it on their website. So, but hook me up later. And I'll I'll show you exactly where the link is if you need it. So, any other questions? Um, yeah, I've recently seen some web shops build on some SAP stuff. Um, Webdyne Pro, yeah. Yeah. Um, are you aware of any like remote SOAP path which access the same interface or anything like that? Um, there's a number of SOAP interfaces. There's some good stuff that um, Jabra um, has been doing. He works for Rapid7. He's been working on some SAP stuff as well. I'm not aware of any Webdyne Pro SOAP stuff that's built in, but you mm -hmm. can deploy applets through um, through SOAP, uh, through SAP NetWeaver that could then talk over SOAP. But then I don't think there's anything there by default. Yeah. So. Because we also scanned the systems internally and saw all these 20,000 open SOAP ports and whatever. It's kind of depressing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, Webdyne Pro is, a, is another thing entirely. There was a presentation at this year's BrewCon which goes quite in depth on some of the failures of um, ICM ICF, I believe, as well, and Webdyne Pro. There's some serious bugs with that stuff as well, including remote code execution stuff. And they don't like to, they do all the cross site scripting stuff just right, as long as it's a field where you put text in. If it's a drop down where there's a number, they don't filter it at all. So you just put your payload into the drop down instead of number one through 10, because they don't expect it to be anything else than what was in the drop down, and then it just executes when the, the verification fails. So I didn't tell you that. That was the O day that Dave said I was going to drop today. Anything else? Okay, well, if there's any other questions, feel free to grab me afterwards. I'd like to thank everyone who helped me put this thing together, especially the Dirty Set guys for giving me feedback. I don't know yet, but they will. So thanks for coming, and sorry for sucking so badly. Thank you.